So I'm here in Hayward at the Gordon residence. If you see behind me, they're just starting to watch the Resonate Sunday worship service. But the difference between my house and your house, how it's kind of been over the months, is that there's not just one family here. There's actually multiple families here, apart from the Hayward Church. As they're coming together just as a group, and all the kids are upstairs watching the Res Kids video, and they're worshiping together. We're actually calling these Resonate Worship Watch Parties, and we're inviting you to host one yourself too. They're actually consists of a group of people of just the people that you invite from your social bubble. If you go to our website, we'll, we can actually give you one of these guys and it gives you some just information, some tools, some items to help you host one of these well. It isn't just you know something that we do individually with God, but we get to worship together in a more communal way. We're adopted into a family and getting to host one of these is just really getting to experience that and allow even more people to worship God. So I encourage you to go to the website, check it out, consider hosting a worship watch party.
think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my
the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my death Sing it out
they shall have eternal life. Amen. Amen.
you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Hey, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, hey, we want to greet you. Uh, you're joining us online. Happy Sunday. And uh, everyone here, you could go ahead and sit down. We've got a live studio audience here in the room. And they're, they're just, they're a little bit rowdy. But what, what that means is that you on, online at home and the people here in this room are actually coming together as one to worship Jesus, one church, one mission, and we are a part of seeing God transform the world. Hey, I know that you guys have been used to, I'm crackling a lot, I know you've been used to uh, joining us at 10 o'clock on Sundays, but there's going to be a change coming up on November 22nd. We're going to make an adjustment so that our online service can coincide with our live service, and we're going to be live streaming every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and that's starting in two weeks, Sunday, the 22nd of November. So set your clocks, uh, get some extra coffee ready, get up and join us and be a part of what God's doing in those worship services. And I, I think it's awesome that we have live audiences, we have more chairs, we have thousands of people who join us online every week uh, through the video. And all of these things are made possible because of your faithful giving. When you give at Resonate, what you're doing is, is you're joining God in his work and you're worshiping him and you're increasing the worship of Jesus so more people in more places can worship him. And we want to invite you to join in giving and in worshiping and, and advancing the glory of God. You can do that. The slide shows you. You can do it online. You can do it by text. You can do it through mailing. Um, but we want to invite you to be a part. And, and a lot of people are being a part of Resonate. Uh, we have had people getting baptized. We've had people joining us uh, through becoming members, covenant members of Resonate Church. And uh, we, we had a bunch of people go through a four-hour-long class and learn what is the, what's the doctrine and the beliefs of the church? What's the mission that God's called us to? What, what is my part if I'm a member of Resonate Church? What does that look like? And they got together, had uh, this class, and they've said, we want to be a part. And today we want to affirm them. But before we show you, we've got a picture of them, but before we show you that, I want to read to you. Oh, you can even look at it. There it is. We want to read to you the covenant and what these people have said because this is beautiful. This is, this is something that uh, I, I think is so rich and so good for us. Yeah, thank you. We're going to try this now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, this is happening. So 
Technical glitches are part of it. And uh, we're glad you're bearing with it. We're glad you're here. I want to read the covenant that each of these members have affirmed. And I'm reading it to you because I want to elevate your thoughts of what it means to be a member at Resonate Church. It says this, As one loved by Christ, adopted as beloved sons and daughters of God, you are now brought into the Resonate Church family as brothers and sisters in Christ. In this new relationship of grace and unity with one another, you will covenant to, and it gives four things. One, protect the unity of our church by acting in love toward other members, by refusing to gossip, by following the leaders, and by mutual submission. Two, your covenant to share the responsibilities of our church family by living on mission for Christ, sharing the beauty of the gospel, loving your neighbor, practicing hospitality with people who are far from God, and they, uh, by joining in that. But number three, we're joining in this covenant by serving in the ministry of the church family. That means you're discovering your gifts and talents. You're being equipped to serve. You're developing a servant's heart. You're taking next steps and growing. And the last covenant, that you covenant to support the testimony of your church family by faithfully attending Sunday, living a godly life, growing in sacrificial giving, and being committed to a missional community. And all these people together, they said, I will. And for all of us who are members, we're saying, I will in our hearts. So would you just celebrate that these people have joined and become a part? Thank God for the next step in their lives and and what they're doing. And, and today, we're continuing with the sermon series called Shook, and Pastor Will's going to be sharing with us a powerful and great message. And before he comes, I, I want to lead us. Just like these new members are saying, God, use me, we want to pray that same prayer. We'll be a part of what you're doing, God. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer, just one asking that God would revive our cities and that there would be a revival and lives transformed suddenly and forever. And to also pray that God would use us. So would you bow your heads with me right where you are at home? And let's, let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you would change lives. You would do miracles. You would open eyes that you would transform hearts. And we ask that you do that in our city, that our city would not be the same, that grace would be a swell throughout our city, that they would just go from person to person, this good news of how you love us, and you'd start a revival. And God, we pray, would you use us? Would you use me? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, how you doing out there, church? How you doing online? So glad that you're with us. Want us to have a special shout out to Hayward, baby. How you doing? So sad that I'm not with you there today, but we know that God is moving in amazing ways. Man, if you're new to our church family, if you're joining us online for the first time, or if you're in Hayward for the first time, hopefully, Lord willing, I'll meet you next week. We're in the middle of a series called Shook, just like your campus pastor said. What we want to do is take a look at, man, as we look at the early church, we see a group of people who were so dedicated to living on Christ's mission, they actually, God used ordinary people, people like you and me, to actually change the world, to flip it upside down. And man, if you look at something like that, honestly, it can be a little discouraging. Even if you're at a church that's really good, like Resonate Church, or if you come from another church that's very good, that preaches Jesus every single week, when you look at the New Testament, when you look at Acts, you see something phenomenal going on. And when you do that, you start to ask a very simple question. What did they believe? What's so different about them? Because as we look at the text, in different places, it says that they have the same Holy Spirit, They were given the same charge to go make disciples. They have the same Bible. What is different about them? And maybe is there something that we're missing? What is it actually going to take for God to use ordinary people like you and me to change the world upside down? Is that something that you want? Is that something that you want for God to use you to change the world? 
Man, I absolutely do. And so we're going to jump right into the scriptures. Can I invite you to stand wherever you are? If you're at home, if you're in Hayward, wherever you are, we want to stand. The reason we do that is because we believe that God is actually speaking to us through these words. So would you follow along with me as we hear the word of the Lord? This is what we read from Acts chapter 2. Luke, the doctor, is writing these words down for us. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came on every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, to any who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. My brothers and sisters, that is the word for the Lord this morning, this evening, and in Hayward and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Man, as you read that passage, did something burn inside of your soul? Did something stir? Did you, did you see like the people coming from all over the world, different ethnicities talking in different languages, having different colors of skin, but coming together in unity? Did you see a group of people who were joyfully selling their possessions because a brother or sister was in need? Did you see a church that was so on mission that it was attractive and people are like, man, I want more of that. Church, is that something that you want? Man, that's something that I want. And I want to ask a question, how do we get there? Because again, I believe that God has given us a wonderful church. It's a great church. And yet, if I'm honest, my church experience doesn't look like this. And the question is, what is it going to take for us to get there? I want to read the passage one more time in case you'd miss it. This is the key. This is what we're going to look at today. Verses 42 and 43, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came on every single soul. God was doing something so amazing that people are like, what is going on here? Wow, what is God up to? And as you look at that passage, we see four things that they were devoted to. Last week, Pastor Ryan covered three of them. They were devoted to praying, They were developed to fellowship, and they were devoted to preaching the gospel to one another by taking the Lord's Supper. And today we're going to look at something that honestly, man, when when Pastor Ryan told me this is what I want you to teach on, I was like, come on, man. That's so boring. Give me something fun. Give 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 me something good. Like I want to come up here and preach with some gusto. And maybe you feel this way too. What is the thing that was missing from the believer's lives? It's one word. It's doctrine. You're like, okay, great. This is going to be a fun sermon. Okay, but listen, doctrine is any set of beliefs that governs person's life. Now, I was amazed by some of the doctrine here in the Bay Area. I had just gotten here, and one of the brothers from Hayward took me out to coffee, and he introduced me to the doctrine of environmentalism, and he was zealous about it. I found out you can only throw out one thing from your cup of coffee. That was brand new to me. And that was just, I just got here and this brother had no problem evangelizing to me his doctrine of environmentalism. And, and now I'm a devout believer. It's, it's, it's a really cool thing. Doctrine is simply one of the things, it's what you believe and it's your belief in action. And I want to put verse 42 on the screen again because I, I want you to catch what the early church was devoted to. It says they were devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The reason why the early church flourished was because they were devoted to doctrine. Remember those other three things? They were also devoted to fellowship. But my brothers and sisters, how did they know how to do fellowship if they didn't have the doctrine to give them real fellowship? They were devoted to prayer. But how would they know what to pray for if they weren't devoted to good doctrine that told them how to pray or what to pray for? And they were devoted to communion. Do you remember Pastor Ryan had this beautiful moment where he talks about, man, this is the body of Christ that is broken for your wholeness? How did the early church instruct one another if they didn't know doctrine that showed them how to apply the gospel to make them whole? See, everybody's devoted to doctrine in one form or another. Just thinking about it professionally, right? Teachers, doctors, lawyers, all devoted to doctrine, the doctrine in their craft. And if they don't continue to study, they will lose their license. They will not be able to continue to do their discipline. What made the early church attractive? 
It was their devotion to doctrine. Now listen, somebody kind of joked and was like, hey, Will, would you define devotion for me? Man, you don't need me to define devotion for you. Some of you fools spend so much time looking at your fantasy football league, your wide receivers, and what cornerbacks are they going to. Man, you're devoted. You know devotion. My kids are devoted to Minecraft, okay? We don't need to explain what devotion is. What the church just needs is to be devoted itself to what? To good doctrine. And the scriptures here tell us what the early church was devoted to. What were they devoted to? They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. But what's weird is it doesn't tell us exactly what that is. So we got to jump to another part of the New Testament to see what they were teaching. This is the Great Commission. Jesus, like one of some of his final words, and we talk about this a lot at Resonate Church, but I want to cover it one more time. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus came and said to them, these are his disciples, not just the apostles, to the to the earliest gathering of believers and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But look what he says for them to do. Teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you. And check this out. That's what behold means. Believe this. I'm with you even to the end of the age. Jesus tells the disciples here, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go make disciples that are going to make other disciples. And they're like, okay, so how do we do that? He says, teach them doctrine. Teach them my words and teach them how to obey it. Now, I'm summarizing this a little bit because unfortunately, Peter and Paul and John, they didn't leave us their Bible study lessons. We don't have any Zoom calls recorded for what they taught in the early church. But we know that the early church was devoted to Jesus' words. And my brothers and sisters... If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you may not know this, but you actually are incredibly devoted to doctrine. There's something you believe about following Jesus Christ, and you have chosen to obey or not obey certain parts of it. The difference is you may have either done this consciously or you may, may have slid into your doctrinal beliefs, but every single person, especially in the early church, they were dedicated to this doctrine. And this doctrine did two things. They learned Jesus' words and they learned him in a way that transformed people's lives. So here's the definition of a disciple I really want us to adopt. A disciple is devoted to Jesus' teaching for life and flourishing. If you look at the early church, this is what a disciple looked like. A disciple was somebody who was devoted to Jesus' teaching for life and flourishing. And I want to cut this up into two pieces and talk about the first one right now. Here's what discipleship looks like. Here's what it looks like to be devoted. A disciple is devoted to Jesus' teaching. So we already looked at the Great Commission, but I want to look at another important part of Scripture. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And scholars have called this the Torah or the important teaching of the Messiah. Messiah is just a Hebrew word that means anointed one. And that's where we get the word Christ. So Jesus, the Messiah. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has these amazing things to tell us about what the kingdom of God looks like. He tells us about the upside down nature of the gospel. He tells us about how gospel people should live. And when he's done, he has these amazing words. Now, listen, I'm going to stop you for a second because the, the words are up on your screen already. And you probably have some of them memorized, especially if you went, if you grew up in the church. Can I, can I caution you to pause for a second and consider what Jesus is saying. Let's read them slowly. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And so when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew against that house, it fell. And there was a great fall. And brothers and sisters, if I were to summarize Jesus' words, that long paragraph, Jesus is saying to us today, doctrine matters. Doctrine matters. What you believe matters. And how you live your life, it absolutely matters. Now listen, the people who were hearing Jesus' words for the first time were so blown away by his saying, when Jesus drops his mic, they said, who is this guy? We've never heard anything like this. This this dude teaches with authority. You know why he taught with authority? Because he's God. Because he's God. And Jesus tells the early church that Jesus tells us, be devoted to my word. Learn every aspect about it. Just take it all in. Do everything you can to be devoted to 
doctrine. Now, five years ago, my family and I, we moved from the Bay Area. We're from the Midwest. We lived in Chicago for 15 years. And so, you know, it was kind of a hard adjustment. But one of the things that was most difficult was actually understanding the weather. I didn't understand the doctrine of Bay Area weather. And on a Memorial Day, somebody invited us to go to a beach. And my family and I, we love beach. My kids love the water. They can stay in the water for all day. And the first thing the Medell household thought was, woo-woo! California sun, baby. But it's Memorial Day. There ain't no California sun on Memorial Day. It's cold. And nobody told me. So I showed up with shorts and a t-shirt and, you know, like a little floaty so I could go in the water. And man, I froze. I was like one of those penguins that was huddling with the other penguins trying to stay warm. It was so cold. And I looked around. I said, aren't we in California? I had ignored the weather doctrine of the Bay Area. And people started telling me like, hey, Pastor Will, they were trying to be respectful. Hey, Pastor Will, this is the Bay Area, so you got to bring layers. You got you to take layers of clothes with you, right? Because it's a different season every hour of the day. And I didn't believe them. I'm like, listen, I don't need layers. I'm from the Midwest. That was my arrogance. I, I don't need layers. Man, I used to pump gas in sub-zero weather in my flip-flops. I don't need any coat. Until I kept going to the beach and kept freezing, (laughs) freezing a lot. It was awful. And finally, finally, I humbled myself and said to some Bay Area people, could you please teach me the doctrine of Bay Area weather? And they took me aside and they said, you need coats in your jacket. uh, Sorry, you need coats in your car at all times. You need tons of layers. You need to prepare for all these things. Yes, Pastor Will, I know you're brown, but you will burn in this California sun. There are things that you have to adopt to the California doctrine of weather. Okay, so now when I go to the beach, I've got my parka, I've got my hoodie, I've got my long sleeve shirt, and I've got my t-shirt. I've got pants that I can pull away so I can jump in the water. Right I am ready. I have adapted because I've learned the doctrine of Bay Area weather. And friends, Jesus has more important doctrine to tell us. And so many of us in our arrogance have not listened to his words. So I'm begging you, please, Listen to the words of our Savior. This is what he says. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine, that's doctrine, and does them, that's the obedience to the doctrine, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell. Man, and great was the fall of it. <laughs> Jesus says, why should we be devoted to sound doctrine? Because there are storms that are coming. He doesn't say if storms come, he says when storms will come. And Jesus says, if you listen to my words, you will have a flourishing life. Jesus is telling us like a parent would say to a child, hey, take a jacket. And the kid goes out without the jacket. And then what happens? The kid starts complaining because they're cold. And in Spanish, the mom would say, que te dije? What did I tell you? Jesus is saying the same thing lovingly, though. He's like, not to earn my love. I'm trying to tell you how to live your life so that you can live it to the fullest. And so my brothers and sisters, this morning, there's a question you have to ask. Are you devoted to learning the apostles' teaching? Are you devoted to doctrine? Are you devoted to learning Jesus' word? So I want to put two questions up there. Here's the first one. Jesus asks you this morning, every single person, do you know my word? Do you know my word? Disciples are devoted to studying the words of Christ. Now here's what we know. Jesus is the creator of everything. The reason I could be devoted to his words is because the one who came up with the system that would keep the stars burning millions and billions of years is the same one that developed my emotions. So I can trust him. I want to know his word. The one who designed photosynthesis is the one that can teach me about how to have a healthy marriage and how to raise my children. I can trust him. That's why I want to know his word. That's why I want doctrine. And the one who created the air molecule so that my body could metabolize food is the same one that gives me the strength to go away from any false gods. I can trust him. And the early church trusted him, and they knew that Christ's words were precious. They were devoted to doctrine. They were devoted to doctrine. And so family, family time, 
As your pastor, I love you enough to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus' word? Do you know his words? Now, please hear this. I'm not asking you to make you feel guilty, and you don't get a shiny star from God if you know his words and they're memorized. This is not to earn God's love. We have God's love because of what Christ did for us. But it still remains, do you know the scriptures? You know, if for some strange reason persecution broke out in the United States and all Bibles were banned and you had no access to the scriptures, would you know Jesus' word? And friends, today is the day that we can start doing that. There's a really easy challenge for you. Did you know that if you read a chapter of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are filled with Jesus' words. If you read one chapter every single day in four months, In four months, you would read all of the Gospels. You could read it a couple times if you did that every day for a year. You would be filled with God's word. If you see Jesus' words in his teaching and your devoted doctrine, this is something that you must do. It's something that he invites you to do today. But it's not just enough to know God's word. It leads to this thing that I want to show you this chart that is really important for our church. Pastor Ryan introduced us this week. And he wanted to show us, what is it that's going to make an attractive church? And he shows that, you know, there are a lot of different ways that we can learn good doctrine. And if you look at top, there's a large group worship. That's what's happening right now. For those of you who are joining us online, you are here because you want to hear God's word. God has given you pastors and teachers that are going to preach to you and teach you the importance of who Jesus is. And if you look on the left, there's also doctrine and and theology. And this is just understanding all those things that you're learning on Sunday morning. But it's also where you're reading your own Bible and you're writing down the things that God is teaching to you. This is important for you to understand God's word. Now, here's the problem with the church. The problem with the church is we spend a lot of our time at the top and on the left, and a lot of people just know a lot of stuff. They know a lot of stuff, and they mistake knowing for obedience. Knowledge is not obedience. Knowledge is knowledge. It just means you know something. You can know all kinds of stuff, but not act on it. And so Jesus asks us a second question today. He says, it's not enough for you to just know my word. The question is, do you obey them? Do you obey Jesus' words? And this is vitally important for us because it leads to our thesis statement, what we're all talking about this morning, which is this, a disciple is devoted to Jesus' teaching for life and for flourishing. See, a disciple knows Jesus and trusts his teaching because we know that we will flourish if we follow our Savior. Now, it's good to be devoted to certain things, right? So some of you, if you have young children at home, you're devoted to your children. Why? Because if they cry and you don't answer... Bad things happen to the child, right? Some of you are devoted to a job. Why? Because if you don't go to your job, you won't eat. Okay, that makes sense. A lot of you students out there, you're extremely devoted to your studies. If your professor or teacher tells you, make sure you have this thing read by the time you come into class tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, you're devoted to doing that because you know that if you don't, chances are the teacher will call on you, right? And your first worst fears are going to come true. That's all true. All of us are devoted to many different things, but my brothers and sisters, in the same way, are we devoted to the words of Christ? Do we say, if I don't consume this, if I don't eat my daily bread, man, I'll die. I'll die. Do we say, man, I want to hear some good sermons about Christ, but I want it to start transforming my body. I want it to transform my heart. And the early church, they had a way of ingesting doctrine, and living in a way that it actually changed their lives. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now, and there is actually precedent for how the church acted during a pandemic. And I want to show you some words of a brother who's a bishop, and this is the report of how the early church responded in one of the early pandemics. He says, you know, most of our brothers, they showed unbounded love and loyalty. They never spared themselves, and they thought of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick. They attended to every need, and they were ministering to them in Christ. And with them, they departed this life serenely what? Happy. They were happy to die. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. You know, many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. 
What is this brother describing? He's describing the rain falling and the flood coming and the wind blowing and the early church's house didn't just stand. It was beautiful. It was beautiful because it was built on the rock. The early church flourished because they had strong doctrine. And my brothers and sisters, can I be honest with you? I don't see this flourishing in our church right now. And I wonder about that because we are a gospel preaching church. Why aren't we flourishing? And I think the reason is because we are not devoted to doctrine. You see, a lot of us, we spend a lot of time in that upper category. We don't miss a single service. We spend a lot of time on the left. We're reading our Bibles. We're pouring through it. We're learning doctrine and theology. But we're missing something that is so important. We're missing the bottom and the right. You see, at the bottom, the early church had this small group intimacy. They didn't just go to the temple. They went to each other's homes. They spent time together. And then on the, on the right, the relationships and the practice, that they didn't just learn what the gospel said. They actually challenged one another with the gospel. You don't need to be a churchgoer to know somebody who knows a lot about the Bible, but is somebody you want to avoid. Am I right? We all, so there's some nervous laughter in the auditorium, but I know that they don't want to laugh harder because it's true. We know a lot of religious people who don't have the joy of Jesus Christ in them. Why is that? How is that possible? Well, it's because they know a lot about the top. They do a lot of worship. They do a lot of Bible study, but they don't spend time in groups and they don't spend time with other people trying to process this gospel. The apostle Paul gives us a roadmap to how the early church handled this so that they could be attractive. Look at what Paul says. In Ephesians, he says, and God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the building up of the body of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine. Paul says, listen, God gave to the church people who understand this so that every time something crazy happens in your life, you're not blown away. He's basically saying the same thing that Jesus said. Storms come, and the stronger your doctrine is, and the stronger you ingest it from the people that were charged to teach it to you, your house is going to remain steady, and it's going to be beautiful. But Paul doesn't end there. Paul says something so important. He says, rather... Instead of being blown and tossed by every wind, instead of being thrown off course, instead of the house falling down, rather, here's how we do it. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. That is to say, Christ. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, it's awesome that you know your scriptures. Please keep doing that. It's awesome that you come to church. But that's not the only thing that you have to do. You cannot love one another in truth from stage. You want me to prove it to you? If I got up here on stage and said, hey, Chuck, stop doing that sinful thing, would that be loving Chuck? Would that be loving to him? No, that would be called abuse, right? If I said, yo, Phil, he knows when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. Okay, well, that's not like truth and love. That's public shaming. So where does practicing truth and love happen in the church? It happens in a more intimate setting. It happens in smaller groups. And this is the reason why, brother and sister, if you've been coming for years and you've never joined an MC or a missional community, our version of small groups, this is why we beat that drum. The only way you can truly be transformed into an authentic disciple, the only way that doctrine can take hold in your heart is if you're living in community with other brothers and sisters who will speak the truth in love to you. Some of you have been studying the Bible so long. You know how Jesus is the better Joseph. You know how the Exodus points to Jesus. You know all the books of the Bible in order, but what you don't have, you don't have somebody who can put their hand on your shoulder and say, brother, sister, your life is not in line with the gospel. I know you say you believe this, but this thing that you're doing proves otherwise. And so I want to give you a few questions that I think would help you gauge if you are living in the bottom and the right quadrants. Here's the first question. When's the last time somebody spoke the truth in love to you? Really? When's the, not, not just you've got lettuce in your teeth and your flies down, but like they actually talk to you 
about Jesus and something about Jesus that you're not believing? When's the last time that happened? And I want to give you the second question, the flip side of that. When's the last time that you spoke the truth in love to someone else? When's the last time you loved somebody so much that you saw them going down the road that is completely antithetical to living for Jesus Christ and you stopped them even though you knew it would make them angry, even if you didn't know how they'd respond, even if you knew it would hurt them? You loved them so much, you pointed them to the gospel. When's the last time either of those things happened? For a lot of us, the answer would be never, or it's been a really, really long time. But I also want to say maybe some of us were like, well, I tell people the truth and love all the time. Yeah, but has, have people told the truth and love to you? Because see, if they haven't, then you're living out of balance. It just means you're going around telling people all the things that they're doing wrong, but you're not living an open life where people can see how you need the gospel. That's not helping you at all. Last week, I was really struggling at work. I don't need to give you the details. But my big brother, Pastor Ryan, came into my office. And I think he wanted to talk about the Dodgers or something, which was kind of, I don't like the Dodgers. But he wanted to talk about something like that. But he looked at me and he noticed my face. He's like, hey, are are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. And I don't want to cry because Pastor Ryan wears like the camo pants. He's just kind of a macho man, you know. I don't want to cry, but I, I just like started tearing up, man. And Pastor Ryan saw that. We went for a walk. And gives me the most beautiful gift of all. He gives me his time so that I can be honest with him and vulnerable. And and he's asking me good questions. Why are you feeling this? What makes you think this way? He's, He's just going through it with me. And after a while, he looks tenderly at me and he speaks the truth and love to me. He says, Will, the things that you're struggling with, these, these are terrible gods. You've chosen poorly the things that you'll worship. He spoke the truth and love to me. And I got to tell you, in that moment, I actually didn't feel condemnation. I didn't feel shame. I felt relief. I was like, oh my gosh, you're you're right. I I didn't see that. I didn't see that that I thought I was working on this sin part of my life, but actually you've shown me where I really need to trust the gospel more. And my brothers and sisters, what I'm really asking you is, do you have anybody like that in your life? Do you have somebody who's checking your six? Do you check the six of somebody else? You see, I know there's two kinds of people in our church. There are some people who are very comfortable sharing their stuff. Man, every MC session, you're coming and you're talking about this relationship or this problem or this job or this thing. And if you're honest, you're treating your MC like a support group or at worst, like a gripe fest. But if you're also honest, Even though you're bringing your stuff to MC every week, you're not growing. You're not growing. You're not experiencing transformation. And the reason why you're not growing is because you're not ingesting good doctrine. You're not devoting yourself to learning Christ's words. When you come to church or when you're watching it online, you're not taking notes and you're not thinking about the things that God is trying to feed you through your church family. Can I invite you this week to just ask Jesus, Jesus, what's the good doctrine I need to ingest? What are your words that I need to hear? What are your words that I need to apply? That's one type of person, somebody who's an open book. But then there's others of you that you have a Bible that has the red letters of Jesus. You own a a Strong's Concordance. Uh, You know some Greek and Hebrew words. You can say words like chesed and you can say chesed in the right way. I mean, you know everything about the Bible, but the truth is, Your heart's not being transformed. And you're not really believing the gospel because you're not opening up yourself to community. You don't believe the gospel because you feel like you need to be perfect for us to accept you. And my brother and sister, would you please look at my face? You can't be perfect. None of us are perfect. You belong here. We want to see the real you. And the real you will be loved because the real us is loved is because of what Jesus did, not because of what we know. And the question you have to answer this morning, brothers and sisters, is which one are you? Which one are you? Where do you need to grow? Some of us need to grow in understanding the scriptures. We need to grow that way. And others of us need to grow in relationships with the scriptures and asking people to pour into our lives and to ask us hard questions. I think this is what God wants us to do as a church family. And I want to give us a very, very practical application of this. 
I want to share something that we can cover here in the large group gathering and through the scriptures, and then I want to give you some questions that you can ask in your MC or some questions that you can just ask somebody on your own. This week has given us an amazing opportunity to practice good doctrine. We had this little thing called an election. And as I doom scroll, I see all kinds of people from, it's from the apocalypse to, oh, thank Jesus, to all these different things that are happening. And listen, I am so thankful that we have a diverse church, but every single one of us is at a different place. And what we need more than just platitudes or everything's going to be okay, we actually need doctrine. We need to be devoted to good doctrine. And so here's what I want to do. I want to put on the screen, wait for just a second. Well, there they go. Words that Jesus has for us this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Brother and sister, did you hear that? My kingdom is not of this world. And so as I hear Christ's words, I want to explain that a little bit for you so that we can get better doctrine. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's asking you a question. Where is your ultimate allegiance this morning? What are you hoping? Let's leave the results of the election out of the picture for just a second. Let's take each party, major party's candidate to its furthest extreme and ask some very fundamental questions. Would Trump restore the church to its former glory? Would Trump be able to do that? Would Biden bring in a form of justice that would bring the justice of God? And the answer, of course, we have to say, no way. Neither candidate is the Messiah. Neither candidate would bring the Jesus all the glory and honor that he deserves. And if that's true, brother and sister, why is our hope on this election? Why is our hope in any political party? Man, how long have we lived in this planet? How long have we lived in this country knowing that peace and tranquility and our worth does not come from an election? As many pastors have said much more eloquently than I could, what would it be like if Christians tossed out their devotion to the elephant and the donkey and instead gave it unapologetically to the lion and the lamb? What would that look like? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, which means, man, it's not a kingdom that's tainted by sin. It's a perfect kingdom. It's got a perfect king, and it's everlasting. How many nations have fallen since Jesus reigned? Thousands of them, and so many that we don't even know. And after the election, as people were struggling, the day after, as they're struggling, you can see it on Facebook, they're struggling with the results of this election. I posted one thing, and I want to read it for you. I don't have a slide. What I want you to do, whether you're home or here in Hayward, I want you to close your eyes, because I want your soul to be influenced and led and comforted by doctrine. This is Psalm 2. This is what I posted. And this is a psalm about Jesus. And let the Holy Spirit minister to you through doctrine. God writes, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his Christ saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. And the one who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And then he'll speak with them in this wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion and my holy hill, and I'll tell you my decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like pottery. So therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Would you kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. What would it look like if the church believed that? What would it look like if the church believed 
if Jesus was actually in control, that when nations or rulers or whoever you consider to be evil is doing something contrary, do you think that it should be done? Even if they are going against God and his plan, do you realize what this passage says? It says when people are plotting against God, what does God do? Does God go get a drink? Is God worried? Is God tripping? God laughs. God laughs because he's completely in control. And brothers and sisters, if we believe that, that doctrine would absolutely make us attractive. What would it look like if the church believed this? You see, we need the top and the left. That's the exposition, the understanding of this word. But we also need the bottom and the right. You see, you need people in your life to ask you some questions. If you're struggling with the election this morning, you need to be honest about that with your brothers and sisters, but you need to have them say some very key things to your soul. I'll give you three examples. They're not on the screen, so just listen to them. <laughs> Is your hope in present kingdoms? You need somebody to love you that much to say, man, it sounds like you're hoping in this, it sounds like you're hoping in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It, do, it doesn't sound like you're hoping in the Jesus Party. Second question, why, why are you so anxious about this election? What, what produces that anxiety? What are you worried about? And how is God greater than that anxiety? Or finally, man, what would it look like in your soul right now if you actually believe that Christ's kingdom was not of this world? <laughs> Brother and sister, Asking those questions would help you root out so many idols, would help you deal with any election, would help you deal with anything because when the rain falls and the flood comes and the wind blows, your house will stand and it'll be beautiful. It'll be absolutely beautiful. This is what made the early church attractive. They had good doctrine. They knew Jesus' words and they obeyed it. They knew Jesus' words and they obeyed it. And this is what allowed them to be an attractive community and what made God add to, their, add to their number daily. My brothers and sisters, do you want that? Man, I absolutely want that. I've got big dreams for our church. <laughs> I've been here for a few years. And man, if you've been here on, on, if you've seen me preach before, you know what my dreams are. Man, I want a church up in the Oakland, Alameda area. I want like five campuses in Hayward. I want a church in Pleasanton. But you know what? That's a good dream. But that's not the ultimate dream that we see in this passage. I, I do. I want a church where we start sending missionaries around the world or we start training pastors and elders to go to different places and just have a school here where we're teaching deep theology. And that's a great dream. But that is not the ultimate dream. The ultimate dream is found in Acts 2, 42, which we read. It's this congregation of believers. That resonate church would be a church where there's awe, where believers hold everything in common, <laughs> where they're deeply devoted to doctrine, and God is doing something through our trust and faith in him. You know, this is God's dream. God's dream is that our church would be so devoted to scripture that all of us would just couldn't get enough of it. We would wake up early to get more of it. But also we'd be committed to talking to one another and saying, brother, sister, this is what you're not believing. This is what you're missing. Let me, let me tell you what this looks like. <laughs> what if in your home, and I don't mean a home with kids, prime 1822, or if you're living at home and you're, you're an older adult, you're living at home, that's fine. But what if your home was devoted to doctrine? What if every single person had the ability, they knew Jesus' words and called other disciples to obey them? What would it look like for children to say to their parents, I love you, I know you raised me, but you're not living according to good doctrine. What would that look like? Oh my goodness we'd see a revival. We'd see people who are not living for their own kingdom, but living for the one whose kingdom is not of this world. We'd see a group of people who are devoted to Christ's mission. And brothers and sisters, you've seen this a little bit, haven't you? You've seen this at Resonate Churches. We've done Make a Difference Day and Street Ministry and Unwrapped, all these different events where we are living on Christ's mission and helping people know the Savior. 
Very early when I came, within the first year or two, we had to make a different stay at the hub where we used to meet back in Hayward's campus. And one of the administrators, we're walking, we're talking about make a different stay, and she, she stops me, puts her hand on my arm. And she's like, I don't understand you guys. I'm like, okay. She's like, no, no, I've, I've seen a lot of religious people before. What makes you so different? <laughs> Great question. What am I supposed to say at that point? Do I say, well, we're a church, so we're supposed to do good things? That is the worst answer ever. You know what I gave her? I gave her sound doctrine. I gave her sound doctrine. I said, you know what? There's nothing special about us, but we believe that there's a God in heaven who actually came to earth, that we have this sin problem that we can't pay for, and this same God willingly died for us God died so that we could live. And since he died so that we could live, how could we not die so others can live? That was sound doctrine. And this is what God wants to do with us, Resonate Church. God says, whoever listens to these words of mine and puts them into practice, they're like a wise builder who built their house on the rock. Resonate Church, would we build our house on the rock? and with prayerful expectancy, wait for revival to come. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much that you love us. You already redeemed us. You don't call us to obey so that we can earn your love. You earn the love for us. God, show us, invite us, call us to just ingest more of your word, but then obey it. Lord, help us to be a community where we lovingly lead each other to the truth. God, would you use us? Would we dedicate our lives to sound doctrine so that you get all the glory, so that more in Hayward, Fremont, Pleasanton, Oakland, Milpitas, Santa Clara would know the one true God who came and died for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Yeah. I want to invite you to find your communion elements. Um, maybe at home you have the little cups we've provided. Uh, maybe you have your own bread and juice. But this is for us knowing something. It's, it's the doctrine and theology. And by having this moment, we're actually putting into practice where it's relationship and practice. So it's, it's both, it's, it's like an application of the sermon. The doctrine that this teaches us is that our sin is so bad and so horrible that a sinless, eternal, infinite in value substitute had to die for us. That's how bad our sin is. And this gives us the doctrine that you love so much that he willingly gave his life on the cross for you. So there's a cracker that represents the body of Jesus. And there's juice in a cup that represents his blood that's shed. I want to invite you to find it. You can take these little cups and pull the cellophane off the top. There's a, a little wafer there. This wafer represents the body of Jesus broken for you. So let's do this together, remembering him. And then if you peel back the lid for the cup, the juice symbolizing the blood of Jesus shed for you. Do this in remembrance of him. And let's pray. Thank you that we can know the truth. That you've shown us the, the doctrine and the truths of the promises. The truths of the gospel. Thank you that we can rest in it, that we can obey it, that we can follow you. Thank you for giving yourself for us to make it available to us, God. And, and we thank you that you are changing us and that you're using us. We ask again, God, would you, by your power, use us to bring revival here. We pray in Jesus' name.
Peace like a river wash over me Immerse me in water as deep as the sea Hide me in love, your healing embrace Peace like a river Wash over me. Come on, church, sing. As I worship your majesty, I worship your holy name. Jesus, my everything. All that I am is yours. Well, let's please.
break out Come now with power Cover this and land Like you've done it before Would you do it again? Oh It's not just a song we sing This is a prayer We're begging for you to move in our lives you be revival in us Holy Lord Amen. Yeah. Applaud again and let it up. Praise Him. Praise Him. Yeah. We're so glad you've joined us today. My prayer is that this week you would put yourself in a place where you can hear His Word. You can hear the truth. Open your Bible. Play the sermon over again. Put yourself in a place where you can hear it. And I pray this week you would Think of the one who loves you so much that he gave himself for you and be in relationship with people that you would see the one who loves you so much. We would become people who obey to hear and to do. So no matter what, your life would be solid on the rock of Christ Jesus. God bless you. Can't wait to see you next Sunday. Have a great day and go with God.